at CNE, just to uh, provide some, some context. Um, so before the pandemic, CNE was set to work in mostly three broad topics uh, in, uh, for Puerto Rico, particularly in the post-disaster context after Hurricane Maria. Uh, we uh, were set to look at uh, housing, as you mentioned, uh, it is also energy policy and the post-disaster reconstruction process. Uh, on this, on the latter, we actually had a lot of talks and and had a rebel chance to over to uh, provide uh, substantial insight into how we should address this. So that was the plan. That was a, we were working on. Of course, the pandemic came by and sort of, um, not you know, turned our plans on their head like everyone else in the planet, I guess. Um, so we started to. Uh, switch gears and, and we're interested in monitoring how the pandemic should be addressing the island. Um, mostly its implications in economic development and, and social outcomes. Of course, we are not public health experts. We are not epidemiologists. We're not trying to do uh, the work of a public health expert. We want to stay in our lane, of course. Um, we think it's important to be informed uh, by, by the voices that actually know that are more that can provide much more substantial insight regarding uh, public health and ep epidemiology. Um, as such, we started to uh, when when the lockdown started. Uh, I think many of you know that Puerto Rico has been in lockdown since March 15th. Uh, CNE started publishing a daily briefing um, just to get provide the broader public updates on how things were going and, and things to keep in mind and things to track uh, regarding the pandemic in Puerto Rico and elsewhere. During that time in the island, um, as I mentioned, we were, on, we were still under lockdown after two months and the governor at uh, some point created two distinct task force to advise her on how to move forward. One was a task force, task force on healthcare issues the other one was a task force on economic issues. So the task force on healthcare issues is composed mostly of healthcare and public health professionals. Um, the task force on economic issues is composed mostly of businessmen and women and some economists that actually do consulting for these very same businessmen and women. Um, that's important to keep in mind. And these two groups they never really saw eye to eye uh, during the course of this whole thing. And the task force on economic issues along uh, the broader business sector started to pressure the governor to reopen the economy, which she started to do slowly on May 4th. Um, and, and when that happened, uh, Deepak had uh, the insight to, to say, well, you know, we're pretty sure they're not following advice from public health officials here uh, to determine how the, the economy is going to reopen. And of course, this is not unique to Puerto Rico. It's happening everywhere in the U.S. as well. As well. Um, but we said, you know, we should do, we should, uh, Deepak said, you know, we should have a role in this. And then uh, he and I got together to uh, see how do a first approach in, the in weighing risk in determining how things should start to slowly reopen. And our first, you know, a first word of advice is to follow, you know, follow the experts, you know, read, read what the experts are saying, read what the epidemiologists are saying. Um, the second thing is, we say, okay, so how do we, uh, lacking better uh, epidemiological data, because the data from the, the Department of Health in Puerto Rico is pretty bad um, because of lack of testing and lack of uh, contact tracing, et cetera. We said, okay, so a better approach to get a sense on how to do this is perhaps get a sense of the profile of risk of different occupations. And, and, and what prompted us to do this was, of course, the fact that the governor wanted to, to roll out uh, a slow reopening of the economy, but also uh, some of the analysis that started coming from the task force on economic issues that were they did some um, an initial 
uh, evaluation on how different industry sectors in the economy were more prone or less prone to 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 risk in the pandemic. So what they did was they used the two digit nights code uh, and data from from the testing uh, to see which industry sectors are actually were more prone to for their workers to to actually uh, get the virus. Uh, the problem with this approach is that two digit, two digit nights code it's about 17 industry sectors. It's a really broad industry sectors, and there's a whole host of workers that do different tasks and different things, and, and some of them are much more exposed uh, to you know, contact with others and more exposed to, uh, to um, viruses and other diseases than, than others. And, and they don't occupy uh, things. They're, they don't all concentrate in a single industry. They're distributed across these industry sectors. So we thought our first approach is to look at the occupations, and that's the dashboard that Evis uh, sent out, where we use uh, data from uh, ONED, the, uh, the ONED program, that has, which has a profile on, on different occupations and their, and their daily tasks to get a sense which occupations are more are more likely to uh, be in contact with other people, to be exposed to risks, and um, also to um, let's see if I get the contact. So basically, I mean, Deepak, you remember the third the, the third factor, third third risk factor? It was closeness. Closeness, uh, exposure to diseases or infection, and contact with others. Yeah. So. Anyway, um, so that gave us, so uh, we crossed that data from ONET with employment data from Puerto Rico from the BLS uh, to then, you know, get a, a sense of the weighted risk of throughout different occupations. And we produce that first dashboard as a way to inform employers mostly, you know, what should be, you know, what should they consider when they start implementing changes in their floor plans and how they're going to operate their businesses to make sure that their employees are looked after, you know, considering that some employees are going to be more prone to uh, be exposed to a disease than others. So that was the first one. So we the afterwards, uh, it occurred to Deepak that we should use that very same data to determine what is the distribution of different occupations across the industry sector, and then use that to determine which industry sectors actually are more more at risk in that sense. And we produce a second dashboard, which I can share with everyone later, um, which I published last week. That uh, that actually provides the same profile and the weighted risk for each industry sector. So that is a um, in that regard. We're of of course we're also monitor monitoring how uh, you know the economy is going to go forward. And while we would love to do some forecasts, uh, and there are you know different consulting firms in the island have been racing to, to do those, we still think that it's too early and the data is still uh, mostly unavailable to make that kind of broad assessment. Um, in the meantime, we can get a sense of how things should start to proceed. And what, that was the idea with those dashboards and making them available for the public. So that's on that area. And the other one on housing, um, like, like in the US, there is a rental crisis uh, going through the entire continental US. It's, I mean, like Puerto Rico, like in other places, after two months of lockdown, it's two months uh, of people not being able to gather income to pay rents. Or if they have, they, even, they either don't through 
credit or through the stimulus money, using the stimulus money, which is a one-time uh, payment. So a, a rental crisis is here. I think some people think it's brewing. I think it's pretty much here. Um, and Puerto Rico is not the less, uh, less aware in that regard. Um, there's a, the, we can, so there are some advantages to things that were handled here. There was actually a, a, a mortgage moratorium uh, that was imposed. Uh, for both private mortgages and uh, FHA backed mortgages. So the FHA backed mortgages were a term were issued some early, you know, early uh, mid March. Uh, this one was a locally approved uh, law to postpone mortgage moratoriums. And now, of course, that's in name only. We don't know if anyone is actually following through on that. Uh, if, if, so if anyone is actually making sure that banks are not actually foreclosing mortgages right now. Um, that's something that has not been made uh, publicly available yet. But it sort of told us, okay, so, you know, to a minimum, at least homeowners are looked after in a sense. Uh, but what about renters? Uh, so there's no relief for renters right now. So we started looking to different options in a way that could provide uh, rent relief. And after reading multiple analysis either from uh, the Urban Institute, the National Low Income Housing Coalition, um, different sc housing scholars, uh, we, we uh, agreed with many of them that probably the best way for Puerto Rico to provide an emergency and expedited uh, rent relief is through a uh, temporary expan expansion of the Section 8 voucher program, housing choice vouchers. Um, obviously, vouchers are not a tool, you know, the, the voucher program is not a tool to address structural issues in housing in the island. That, it's never going to do that. We're thinking more of a, uh, an actual emergency measure. So we started to do some numbers, which is what uh, Evie shared with everyone, uh, to see how much that would cost uh, to, do, to get a, a conservative estimate. So we're looking at households that were at or below 50% of area of uh, area median income, as determined by HUD for each municipality, uh, using census items data, uh, census data from items, and. What we found was that approximately some uh, 170,000 out of 380,000 total renters in the island uh, were at or below 50% AMI. Uh, with, from those 170,000, we subtracted the, the units that are in some shape or form um, subsidized by HUD currently in what, through whatever program, either public housing or uh, you know, uh, Section 202 housing or Section uh, project-based Section 8 or tenant-based Section 8. And that's a pro approximately 100,000 units. So there are still 70,000 uh, households in the island that are below 50% AMI that before the pandemic uh, uh, are not, uh, do not receive any form of subsidy for the rent for the rentals. So, and that, and, and we sort of did a cross check quickly that with uh, other places and, and what that number suggests is that uh, one out of five households that might be eligible for a Section 8 voucher actually receive it, which is more or less, more or less in tandem with the trend in the US, which is uh, on average one in four. Um, so, it, so after getting to that number, it's 73, 74,000 households that might be, that, that could receive a voucher, but do not, do not currently receive it. We had, we needed a number of how much it would cost per household. So we found uh, a subsidized housing data from HUD. Uh, we showed that it, uh, HUD spends in, in average $514 per voucher in Puerto Rico. So we multiplied that number uh, per month. So we multiplied that number for the total households and that 
brought us to a number of 37 to 38 million dollars per month. So that would suggest that to provide rent relief through the Section 8 program to, to burden households that earned the, whose incomes are 50% or below uh, AMI, it would cost $456 million. And like I said, that's a, that's a conservative estimate because we're likely uh, underestimating the number of households that might be eligible for that, but for a voucher of that. And also because uh, using 50% AMI is, uh, although those are the rules for HUD, it doesn't mean that you don't have households that are 80%, 120% AMI that actually fall under the poverty level in the island. Most likely they do. That's right. Uh, and one of the reasons we also suggested this is, is prior experience with how HUD has been working in the island, especially in post-disaster context, and how things uh, during the pandemic has been working in the island. So, there, there have been some different uh, ideas to set up new programs to actually provide this rent relief. We we're sort of uh, skeptical of that approach, mostly because uh, we've seen that when you try to uh, start programs from scratch during this pandemic, they actually are unable to provide an expedited relief to their constituents. So a good example is actually the uh, $1,200 uh, economic stimulus payment uh, program for, from the CARES Act, which actually uh, is taking a long time to be set up in Puerto Rico. Mostly because it required Puerto Rico to set up, uh, to, uh, it, it required Puerto Rico to set up unique parameters on how they were gonna design the program that didn't apply to other places. And also um, I experience working closely on how hard uh, has been managing the post-disaster reconstruction in the island suggests that HUD has been uniquely adamant uh, to on to uniquely adamant its requirements on Puerto Rico compared to other jurisdictions, which means that if you provide too much leeway and discretion to HUD, they're likely made uh, life harder here. But also, they've been uh, very uh, they lacked agility to expedite the, the post-disaster reconstruction process themselves, even where Puerto Rico has met the requirements. And at the same time, there's an issue of state capacity in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico is undergoing an austerity process right now that has chipped away uh, considerable capacity in terms of staff and budget, which makes uh, setting up a program from scratch all, all, the, all, the, more, all, you know, all the more difficult. So you think the best way to approach it would be to a program that's already here, it's already working, it's already established, it's already staffed, it already has clear guidelines, uh, it has offices in uh, the, PA, the local PHA, PHA in Puerto Rico has about 76 offices throughout the island. Um, so from, given those choices, we think that it might be the best approach. So what is the environment in DC right now? So our, our director of our, D, our DC office, so CNE has a DC office. Uh, the, its director, Rosana Torres, uh, who used to be a chief of staff of Congresswoman uh, Nidia Velasquez, has worked for multiple agencies in, in the federal government, um, has been so, so, sort of uh, pitching the idea to different stakeholders over there. And, you know, at, at the moment, at least in the, in, at the House, they already approved the hundred billion dollar uh, rent relief, uh, you know, uh, money as part of the hero of the Heroes Act. Uh, so you have to see if it goes anywhere in the Senate, but uh, but it has gained some traction uh, on some senators, like mostly in the Democratic Party, and have been willing to look into this issue more closely for Puerto Rico. And also uh, some of the, uh, the, look, the Puerto Rico government agencies, including the, the Puerto Rico Federal Affairs uh, Administration and the local PHA. Of course, they have to take into consideration that a program like this will have to be proposed and, or have to, and you have to consult with the, the fiscal board at some point to see if, if 
they would agree to go forward with. So that's where we are right now. I guess that we're also, uh, given that, that Vivienda and Core 3 and FEMA are speeding along in the reconstruction plans, we're sort of trying to monitor that as well. You know, so this whole thing gets convoluted pretty easily. But that's, I uh, would say, where we're at right now. So if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer uh, in the best way I can. Thank you, um, Raul. Uh, so if anyone has questions. I have a question. Huh. Um, yes, Bill. Uh, this, this very interesting presentation. This is a, a, a demand side kind of study is on the supply side, have you done any work on um, the existing housing supply? Is it, is it enough? How much would it need to be expanded? Is it, um, is it spatially uh, in the areas that um, uh, the people need to live? So that's m my fundamental question because most of the research on, on housing vouchers in, in the US is that most people live within two or three neighborhoods uh, of where they lived before after they get a voucher. So it's very uh, spatially sensitive. So on the supply side, have you done any thinking about that? Yes. The reason why we looked at uh, data, most current data uh, from the census is because we wanted to focus on existing renters. Mm -hmm. So these are people that are already living in, in, in rental, in rented houses. Uh, they wouldn't need to put, be built additional housing. Um, that doesn't mean, like I said, this is not an approach to address structural issues because there is a long, you know, uh, a long pattern of geographic exclusion and segregation in the island, and and and, and that has to be addressed. And we're thinking is mostly just to make sure that actually people stay in place. As, as we know, you know, housing is a, right now is the essential infrastructure of public health in this pandemic. Uh, even when the economy at some point starts rolling out, um, it's likely that, that additional lockdowns will take place in the future. And you have to make sure that actually people have a house to be, you know, to be in, to shelter themselves. And at least for the renters, um, that, that, that you know, that's what we think is the best way to move forward. And that's what we focus on existing renters. Okay, thank you. Hello, this is Paul Hall down in Chicago. Of the seventy thousand, uh, I should say, of the hundred, uh, of the hundred thousand currently subsidized, either in public housing or with vouchers. How many of those are actually housing choice vouchers and how much is public housing? It's, in other words, it will, will the existing housing choice vouchers now have to be doubled, quadrupled, tripled? You know, how much more would it have to be expanded from its current program other than public housing? It will have, it will have to be expanded, I think, four times, four times. Uh, you have to take into consideration, of course, that um, there are approximately, I think, 26,000 public housing units in Puerto Rico. Uh, Tenant-based vouchers, I think it's about 18,000 in the island right now. But there's a waiting list for public housing of approximately uh, 16,000 people. And there's like, another waiting list for vouchers, which is approximately 10,000 people. So the, you know, one, one advantage for actually, you know, expanding the program is that you already have a list of eligible uh, applicants and where you can actually expedite and issue vouchers for these people quickly. So considering, considering that there's likely uh, overlap between these two waiting groups, it's like it's possible that you can uh, issue vouchers for, for about 20,000 of those in your waiting list. Uh, pretty quickly. Thank you.
I don't know if uh, other people have questions, um, but um, I wanted to ask like two things. Um, one, it goes back to like uh, Bill's question about the, the, de the demand, uh, but more from thinking about the landlords, um, because obviously like, uh, like a good analysis would be also thinking about like how, what would be the multiplier effect in the economy, how people that are landlords right now might avoid foreclosures um, of these like properties that they have, given that the economy is doing so badly. So there might be an argument there about helping um, landlords. At the same time, I don't know why is the landscape in, okay. in Puerto Rico in terms of like units um, that are uh, good for people to occupy, especially thinking about where people will qualify areas of San Juan in Santurce, that the units are not um, that great. So it might be kind of like a mismatch there uh, between what people are looking for and where they can uh, go. So that's like one question. And the other question is like um, more about the temporality of it, because if it's like one year, like the housing choice voucher program doesn't really work that way. So what, what would be the benefit of doing it that way as opposed to other programs like the rapid rehousing program that is more like temporary housing uh, or even with like the uh, TSA um, from, from Pima or other types of temporary housing. Yeah, there are multiple reasons for, for that. So yeah, like you mentioned landlords, that's one of the advantage we think of this program. It actually uh, helps both renters and landlords. Uh, unlike the US, most the vast majority of landlords in Puerto Rico are not corporate landlords. That's uh, uh, almost non-existent figure in the island. Now, maybe after the storm, after it's a different story, but uh, uh, but at least before, um, it is very uncommon to actually see a, a, a figure of a corporate landlord as, as prevalently as the U.S. So these are mostly what, what people call mom and pop landlords. Uh, many of them have uh, mortgages, and a concern here is that not only is it that they won't be able to pay their mortgages and and put landlords in risk also, but also uh, many of these mortgages are, uh, might be, we don't have the number, might be, uh, are not, probably not mortgages insured by FHA. So it's, pro it's probably uh, private insurers that um, it's very hard to actually protect banks from those private lenders and insurers uh, if landlords can't default on mortgages and then banks can't pay uh, whatever bonds are attached to those to those mortgages. So it has a chain reaction that, that we're concerned about. And the, the lack of data really, sh you know, provides more, more basis for concern. The other thing is that the reason we didn't think of TSA, we thought of TSA from FEMA, it's just that it was such a, an utter disaster in Puerto Rico when they implemented that program um, after Hurricane Maria, that it's, you know, at the time, we thought that, uh, that that wouldn't be the best way to go around it. Um, and, and also because in a way, you also need to to to, to implement a TSA as, uh, for as a rental assistance, which is different from a TSA immediately after uh, a disaster. Many of those uh, uh, vouchers from TSA or or that aid from TSA goes through hotels more than than actual landlords. Uh, the problem is that also need considerable uh, new program design to actually be turned into a rental assistance. Uh, for island island wide, so that's the reason we didn't look into it. Um, and the other reason is, like I mentioned, that the other programs that yeah, you can you can have home, or you can have CDBG. But the thing is that if you use funds from those programs, first and first they will have again to set up new guidelines, assign staff to actually review applications for for rental assistance, we actually have to build that from the ground up. But also, it's though it you would take away funding from those programs that could be used to acquire new proper new properties or vacant properties that might be used later for affordable housing. Uh, it would take funding away from 
setting up a temporary shelters for homeless uh, in the island uh, or, te or building temporary housing for, for, for the, uh, the vulnerable populations in the south after Earth have to go through, they are still recovering from the earthquakes as well as the, as the pandemic. And, and that's why we defaulted to this less than perfect option. Um, and also because we, we consulted the local PHA and other, and other government actors on this. And, and given, you know, given their feedback, it made it pretty clear that they also think it's probably a more, you know, it'd be easier to implement in other alternatives. So the, the rapid rehousing program doesn't exist in Puerto Rico that, that you know of. This is more like which, it's which, like which one? A rapid rehousing program? No. No, and actually uh, they, what they're proposing to use the rental assistance is through the ESG uh, emergency the the emergency stability grants, uh, which is mostly to provide quick grants for uh households that are prone to to be left homeless uh, it was you know created after the 2008 2009 financial crisis um and actually the the, the proposal is actually works like a voucher program so that's why we said let me start the proposal you might as well use, just use the voucher program mm, yeah i mean like the just the difference between that is like it's temporary right so the something like the rapid rehousing it could be like one month or three months or five months, it could be up to a year, but no more yeah. than that, with the assumption that people, you know, get back on their feet and um, and then, you know, goes like, otherwise is the commitment of like, being like more long-term housing, which is always a better idea, of course. <laughs> but uh, I was just wondering, I wonder if other people have uh, questions. Well, I, I just have a, a comment and and I think the um, the use of an existing program if for all the reasons um, that were mentioned that Raul said that you have a voucher program in place and you have the forms and you have everything uh, certainly um, is the is has enormous value in on the implementation side you're not creating anything new you're just um, expanding some existing program and you're filtering the the money in to make sure that the the housing stock is stabilized for the renters for this period um it certainly um, you know it, it certainly replicates uh, uh the thinking of other researchers having to look at large scale disasters that this is a a you know, a great, a great choice, a great programmatic choice. And f for the reasons of, uh, you know, no cost of, Im you know, implementation, except for expanding some staff, uh, it has a lot of value. It, it really has a lot of value. It puts money in the right place at the right time. Um, so I think you guys have done a good, good job of thinking this through and, um, and I hope it works. Um, I hope you can get some support for this uh, uh, for a period of time. Angie has a question. Um, during I mean, you know, stands, there's no guarantee that any form of price relief is going to be approved at the federal level. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, during Hurricane Maria, we experienced a, a a record-breaking amount of rejections for FEMA assistance from Puerto Ricans. Um, how about in this program? Are, uh, do you know what the uh, approval versus rejection rates are? Would be. Would be, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, no, I'm not sure. Actually, that's a, you bring a really important point. One of the things we've discussed with the local PHA uh, that briefly mentioned in the OPEC policy in, in Neuvodia is that you have to make uh, the actual requirements for the vouchers. Uh, okay. You have to ease the requirements significantly. Yeah. Uh, 
to, to actually get people to apply it. That's why it has to be through federal policy. It's not, it's not just a, a local initiative to, to apply for additional funding. It has to go through federal policy. Uh, that it makes it explicit that you have to make requirements easier to to meet not only the inspections but also uh, how you pr provide proof of income uh, hmm. because if it, if it requires people to present uh, their tax file and they work mostly informally they're not going to have any tax file to show income you can do it through an affidavit though and and that would be enough and, and the inspections, you can do it through an audited process later on. Uh, so there are options. There are options to make it easier. Because if it's, if it's just to expand the pro a temporary expansion of the program is right now, yeah, the re rejection rate would be pretty high. Right. Also considering, oh, yeah, also considering because a lot of renters actually rent in, 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 you know, in informal settlements uh, from landlords that don't have their own title to their property. So that's an additional consideration. That should be taken into place because otherwise it's going to defeat you know it's for the purpose <laughs> yeah, i think the other issue is that the that the hud also looks at the units being up to code and um i think that again like in puerto rico that it's not only that the landlord might be informal but also like a lot of the units will not be um up to code for for hot so that's why it's another consideration Any other questions or thoughts? Can I raise my hand? See, I think it's time for HUD to consider to consider uh, using this innovative program for HUD to consider uh, a waiver for Puerto Rico because what you're proposing, HUD has a very small scale granted waivers in Puerto Rico. For, in La Perla they did, they've allowed federal money to be used to rehab two small houses, which never would have met the housing quality standards, but they did it. Uh, to, and <clears throat> it's, the housing units are still there and so on. But I think, um, you know, the economic approach here, um, the justification is economically, this not only is this gonna be more just, but economically it's going to be more sound, what you're proposing. And I think, um, I'm. How, how often are the um, people on the waiting lists of requirements, uh, how often are they, they have to reapply every year. I mean, you just can't be on the list forever. So there are already some built-in controls to this. Yes. Um, can't add anything else to what you said, Lucia. You said it all right there. Um, yes, that's, I mean, there are precedents there's precedent to make sure that this could actually be implemented. Mm -hmm. If I may just add, Raul, that w when, when we were initially thinking about this idea, um, we thought that the biggest roadblock we would find would be in the local government. But surprisingly, the PHA has been extremely forthcoming and wanting to uh, devise a solution. For two reasons, I think. One, because they care, at least a person who currently runs the public housing authority cares uh, about this issue very deeply. And two, because they know that if for some reason the federal government approves a rental subsidy program, they don't want to be caught in the middle of, um, of a pandemic storm, if you will, uh, of funding that they can't disperse. This has been a problem in Puerto Rico already with the CARES Act. There's been numerous problems um, with the disbursement of funds, as you very well know, uh, following Hurricane Maria. So they have an incentive to actually act fast and act effectively. And when we proposed the idea, they were actually very forthcoming and very open to studying the, the proposal and to sort of shepherding it uh, up the flagpole, if you will. So there's we're either going to see a situation where if it passes Congress, the PHA is going to have to act fast, uh, or we're going to see um, a tacit recognition from the PHA that they should um, endorse this idea. We already have a quick endorsement from the Puerto Rico Federal Affairs Administration. Okay. They're behind this proposal, uh, and then been helping our DC office to sort of shepherd this along Congress. Any idea that comes from NGOs in the pandemic context we have been told 
has to have the uh, seal of approval from the you know sponsoring government or the government where the money is going to flow into so we met that benchmark very early on and they're now just keep at doing advocacy work and working towards trying to get this passed in congress so we're still keeping our fingers crossed but we're willing also to work directly with the pha to try to come up with solutions that say you know problems will arise there's no doubt about it this is like i said when you have a, a four fold increase in applicants you're going to run into problems but this is a good problem to have you have money to disperse and you need to disperse it in an efficient quick way and a just way so we were more than willing also to work with the pha to come up with solutions and if you all have solutions as well more than happy to listen to them and uh, touch base with you guys as the as problems arise i would this is paul roldan again i would offer up that one major hurdle, uh, if this is successful, could be housing quality standards, you know, the inspection of the housing, uh, because, uh, you know, federal requirements can get pretty finicky about that. So there could be a lot of rejections of, 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 uh, of apartments for qualified renters. Yeah, I was going to mention the same thing. Um, you're building codes and standards, trying to, if you're expanding the program and there needs to be sort of an expansion of housing units that are covered under this, how, like, I don't know, the process of inspections or certifying that these houses are up to code, um, making some kind of provision for that, because that's going to be a huge hurdle. Yeah, so when we spoke to the PHA, they, uh, they're the ones that have to conduct the inspection for points. Um, what they told us is that if, if, if a program like this is actually implemented, they could actually uh, start the inspection prospectively uh, uh, after it starts. So that, that's an alternative to actually, you know, uh, actually provide some time after the voucher group provides some time for households to get, you know, to get up to code. Um, So in, in, you know, that might be a silver lining there in, there in that regard. Um, I think that would be helpful in South Texas um, after Hurricane Dolly. One of the issues was there was this rush to get home inspections. So uh, this was for FEMA relief and the quality of the inspections went down because the inspectors were just trying to, keep, you know, complete all of these inspections really fast. And they were just making money off of each inspection. So I think even having that time to sort of spread them out might be really helpful as well. So that sounds like a, like a good option. That sounds very good. You work with Colon the Colonias, right, Daniel? Yeah, yeah, we've been doing, there was a lawsuit about those inspections and we've been doing a case about those. And the inspectors were being paid per inspection. So a lot of them weren't even getting out of the car to look at the house they'd pull up sort of check a box and then move on to the next one because they're getting paid per inspection, not the quality of the inspection. Yeah, thank you. That's always a, the more we read about the experience in the colonies, the more, definitely more lessons could be had from, from that experience. So I think that we are like at the end here, but I just wanted to say not only thank you, but also like if there's a way that we can do like advocacy or um, writing letters, um, some of us also part of the National Low Income Housing Coalition and other groups. Um, so just like feel free to um, ask us. And also like some of us that are here are like uh, developers uh, like Elizabeth and Paul um, and other people like research housing so um, again if you need anything just like feel free to say something and we will just forward to see who wants <laughs> to give comments or whatever it is any help that um, you guys might need um, again like we're really happy that there's organizations like CNE and people like Raul and Deepak that uh, are like working endlessly <laughs> to like make a better Puerto Rico. So thank you uh, very much uh, for your work. 
for the um, next planners for Puerto Rico meeting. We will be actually talking about the fiscal plan for this year. And we invited uh, Jose Caraballo Cueto. Uh, he's a assistant professor at the University of Puerto Rico. Um, and he has been giving talks about specifically the fiscal plan, which is kind of, um, it, it keeps changing, right? So we still have to pay the debt. Um, there's like, obviously some like worse things in the, in the plan um, with COVID uh, or the fiscal uh, situation in Puerto Rico is like looking worse, but also the plan has good things like the, there was like going to be removing previously all funding basically, almost 100% for most, most municipalities um, from the, from the uh, money that they got from the central um, government, but that's not going to happen anymore. So anyway, like Jose um, Caraballo Cueto will be talking to us about some of the changes and implications of the uh, fiscal plan. Um, and this will be on July 2nd at for uh, Puerto Rico time. So thank you very much uh, for to everyone for attending, especially uh, Raul for such a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.